So, good morning, everybody. Um, I can start without that. Um, if you look at the news, yesterday, the day before yesterday, Japan, rainfall, mudslides, people dying, United States, uh, flooding. Can I use the microphone? Yes, I can use the microphone. So, um, this is what we hear in the news, and we all know about climate change. And the question is, what do we do as humanists, and what as DH guys? Um, we cannot do as humanists much about rain and wind. We can conceptualize it. And uh, a lot of the discourse is changing into the direction of resilience. So before, let's say 10 years ago, people mainly talked about vulnerability, where vulnerability could be kind of taken as a photo. We could take a photo of a concrete wall uh, and say, oh, this concrete wall protects the people. But if we talk about resilience, we cannot go into a village and take a photo of resilience. There is not one object we can take a photo of. There is not a social structure, not a sign, not a, an agency which is responsible for resilience, and there is probably in a community not even the word of resilience. So, question is, that is the main question, how do we go into a village and document resilience uh, without anybody talking about it in the village or nothing prepared for us? So this requires a lot of conceptualization, what is culture, what is resilience, what can we document, etc. So the purpose is to put resilience into the database, very simple. So uh, I'm doing this work with two colleagues, uh, John Yaching, she's currently in Hamburg, and uh, Yuan Boutin, who is ill in Paris. Uh, that's me uh, working on a graveyard, taking photos of a tombstone in a temple, I have a background in psychology and linguistic computation linguistics. I work on the database, digital humanities, the usual stuff, et cetera, archiving. Uh, this is Yaqing. She also does field work. She does now her PhD in um, human geography in Hamburg. This is on the field work in Ponghu. Uh, we talk about Ponghu. Um, she, she is uh, looking at Ponghu and resilience. And this is Yuan um, doing field work again. And he is a sinologist, studying Chinese, Chinese scriptures, history, working on this um, Takmon project, which unites us all. Field work, he is training field workers. He is uh, working in didactics and anthropology. So the Takbon project, which is similar, let's say, similar to what you've seen before, it's a way of structured, a structured way of approaching cultures. For example, here we have a tomb. We, with a camera, we approach the tomb in a very structured way, take photos, not beautiful photos, but one from the right, one from the left, one of the tombstone, which is the third, one of the altar in front of the tombstone, one of the earth god to the right, one of the... Um, stove to the left and send some some other more photos and then we put the uh, the photos in the database and there's an annotation process you all can imagine that you have some buttons you say what material what color etc and then there is a transcription of the inscriptions of the tombstone um, and all that goes into the database but still we have no resilience right we have all these facts about stones um, so we do this till 2007. We have about uh, half a million photos, about 130,000 sites, where a site can be a tomb, uh, a temple, a house, a prayer site, a spiritual site, and all this. Uh, about 700,000 objects, a tombstone, a base, an urn. And we have done 1,634 days of field work, which is kind of four four and a half years of field work in a row. Uh, and in average, it is every fourth day we have a day of field work and we take about 400 photos and come back and process them. But, but that is just uh, averaging. So the area where we are working, you have now to change your, your head a little bit, but it doesn't, uh, maybe it's. Uh, so it is, uh, we, we work in, so we are basically located in Taiwan. So Taiwan is not Thailand, right? Taiwan, Thailand. 
So we are in Taiwan, which most people say it's no country, but the Taiwanese say it's a country. We work in Japan, and here we have Kagoshima, uh, Okinawa, Ishigaki, which is very interesting for us. Then here is the area, uh, Ponghu, it's an archipelago. I will show the, the photos, and we work in Hong Kong, and all this area here, up to Thailand, the north of Thailand, where Chinese migrated from the north to Thailand, and Malaysia and Singapore. Uh, basically where Chinese migrants move to and then we compare the Chinese migrants to the local people and different religions and, and all this stuff. Uh, this is roughly, so China, 5,000 sites, but you see Taiwan has 90,000 sites, which is our, the center of our interest. Uh, we're more and more going to Thailand. So this is Taiwan, <coughs> where we have most sites, and there you already see appearing uh, this archipelago, where we will talk about most of the time, which is the Pongu archipelago, um, which is kind of between, between Taiwan and China, and uh, it has a rich history conquered by the Dutch, uh, by the Ming, by the Qing, and uh, it's a very interesting, for me, very interesting site, and that is the site where we go most of the time and do most of our research. So everything we try, we first try there. So we almost got all tombs, all temples, thousands of houses. So whatever we want to do, we experiment, we do it first there. The, the site is very austere. So basically volcanic rock with just a slim uh, coverage of soil, uh, very, very strong winds in winter, the winter monsoon. Uh, you have typhoon in summer, you have uh, storm surges. Um, so all bad things you have. In winter you cannot go from one island to the other because the waves are so big. So as a consequence you have a kind of homogeneous culture, but still from island to island you have small differences. You can look at how cultures develop differentiate, etc., according to environmental condition. And that's what we're looking for. We're interested in the relation between environment and culture when we approach uh, resilience. So this is a photo of Ponghu and how to make sense of it. You would, uh, looking at it, you would say, oh, that's messy, I don't understand anything. True, I showed you a messy photo. So here we have a, a stone which is, uh, which is uh, a shugandang, this is a kind of protective stone, a spiritual protection of the village with an inscription. Then we have here a wall which um, has here a garden. We have here a bucket with probably water in it. Then we have a road and then behind the road we have another wall made of concrete. So another stuff probably built by the government. And then we have some rocks and then we have the sea and then... so. What are the things we have to take photos of? What are the sites? What are the objects? That's the first question. So, two answers very quickly. Uh, the inductive way is um, we talk to local people. And if they have a name for a space, then it's a space. If they say this is a temple, then we say it's a temple. If they say this is that, then we say, okay, it's that. First thing. The second is, um, a deductive approach. We think about what are cultures, what are cultural practices, and places where cultural practices take place, these are sites. Like when say, people say, I go praying, a place where they go praying, this is a site. Or objects they use in their practices as an object which is of interest for us. So these two approaches. Um, we talking as uh, this, this, uh, in this ethic way, we talk about cultural practices. Local people have their have the names uh, for, for the activities, for the objects and the sites. So cultural practice. Now, now um, we have to do some conceptual work. What is cultural practice? What is culture? Difficult things. So uh, culture. I define as enacting the acquired, very simple. Or we could say culture is practicing the acquired. You might think this is, this is uh, silly and stupid. It is, it is simple for a good reason. We call it a slim definition, which is easy to falsify. So show me that I'm, I'm wrong. 
and it requires me to have a lot of conceptual labor. So for example, from going to cultures enacting the acquired, and you say sausage is the culture of New York, or hot dog, let's oh, sorry, uh, then I have to show you that hot dog is enacting the acquired. So I have to do a lot of work, and I can, and you can show me that I'm wrong. And culture practice, this is the first, not yet the definition, culture practice has two variants. One is the enacting, and one is the acquiring or the teaching. So, for example, if I write, if I write in whatever language, this is a practice but it has before a practice of me learning that and the practice of someone teaching me eventually. So these are all cultural practices which contribute to um, culture. In addition, very important, all these are verbal construct, enacting and acquiring. And in linguistics, we talk about uh, valencies or frame or argument, so each of them has arguments. So who acquires, when acquires, how acquires, where acquires. So with the simple definitions, we get a set of variables which we can project into the reality and start to collect data. So we get closer to Pongu, still 10 minutes to go, uh, trying to make sense of this. So what do we have? I turn around. So we have uh, here the village outside the garden. I said it's volcanic, but here we see scent. So somehow scent has arrived here and probably the walls help to collect the scent, right? Then we see here these structures in the ground which are probably made to, uh, for watering the plants so that you need less water. Then you have all the walls, uh, walls of stones and then some other materials which uh, very likely are supposed to protect the plants from the wind, but also maybe to collect the sand or to prevent that the sand is blown away. We have here a gate to enter that place. And most of these plants are cabbage. What you don't see, the, the photo has been taken in October, uh, beginning of autumn. So people are, at that time start to plant their cabbage. Um, here we see a temple outside the village. How do we make sense of it? So uh, talking about cultural practices, we have uh, many cultural practices like gardening, watering plants, building walls, building gardens, etc. And we have to answer all these questions of who, who does that, how do they do that, when, I said for example planting in October, uh, which tool do they use, we talk about that, how have they learned it, by whom, and uh, what, are the, what are the contexts. So for example, this is on the um, southwest southwest side of the village, so the garden is kind of protected uh, from the wind through the village. We go into the details, 12 minutes. Uh, so what we see here is that uh, someone collected stones here, maybe throughout the years. Then they started to plant a patch of cabbage plants, not all. We see there is some more planting plant for the future. We have a kind of modularity and a kind of planning. Uh, and here we have already 10, 12 stones lying. And each plant is, has a kind of deepening here for water and has two stones in front of them into, showing into the direction of the wind, protecting the plants against the wind. Um, what we see here is what Bourdieu calls the modus operandi, that is the way of operating. Or what we can, we don't see it. Sorry, I said it. The guy is not there. And if it's there, we would have to stay hours with him or with her to see all this. But we get very close to the modus operandi. So we see that, that the person collected stones here for the years, prepared all this, uh, did all this work, has here a can of water with a slab on it to prevent evaporation, and here probably uh, more water. So the modus operandi, we see how a, a, a culture practice is performed. Question, is that important? Maybe. What we see here is, if we look at the detail, we see again the cabbage plant and the stones, and here maybe this kind of deepening where you, you put in some water, you see this is wetter than this. Uh, 
This would what Bourdieu would call the opus operatum. That's the final result. We have these two things we can observe, the modus operandi and the opus operatum. Are they really important? Partially, because all they can give us is a kind of beginning to induce induction, the grammar. The grammar of gardens, the grammar of building, the grammar of doing. So here, uh, so what we start to do is to build grammars of culture. So uh, this is, sorry, I got, Zai Zai is, uh, sorry, this is just a word for a garden in Penghu, and most of the gardens have three walls, a high wall and two lower walls, and the winter wind comes from northeast. So this rule said, if you have a garden and the wind is like this, what do you do? You build the garden in this direction so that the highest wall protects the garden from the wind. That is a rule, simple rule. It's induced from what we observe. By deduction, we can test it and verify it. We have done that, and kind of 85% of all gardens, five minutes, ooh, 50% of all gardens work like that. We have to look at the other 5% why. So, uh, the culture practice has the modus operatum, uh, modus operandi, helpful, but not what we want, the opus operatum, helpful, but not what we want. We want to have the, the grammar. And uh, so in the grammar is the collection of the grammar rules, just by adding and interaction, and just retranslating it into Bourdieu, it would be, the grammar would be, uh, or the grammar rules would be the disposition, the habitus, and the uh, schemes of perception. So, now I talked about a lot of things. Who, when, how, etc. But I didn't answer the main question. The main question is why? Why do people this? And there is only one answer to all of this, and this hypothesis, that is survival. Just like in biology, and we get very close to biology where resilience is also a very important term, they all, culture does all this to preserve culture. It is not that culture has a will, but if culture doesn't preserve culture, culture will disappear. Just like a worm, a worm who doesn't care about herself or itself will die, will not reproduce. It is just this simple fact. So survival of the culture is what drives everything, and resilience is the mechanism of survival. So uh, it's a mechanism of a system. So there are two aspects which are related. The one is homeostasis, that is, uh, my body is a system, okay, my body gets hot, I cool it down. My body gets cold, I create some heat. So this is kind of balance. But sometimes, what is very important in resilience is this beneficial transformation. Something happens to me which is out of the normal. A storm, I get fever, I go to the doctor, I do something special, I get advice from a friend, etc. So, and just in the same way as in biology, a biological system has a kind of biological resilience, we claim that uh, culture has a kind of cultural resilience. So yesterday, uh, we still had a discussion, what is a system? I added this definition, a system is a broader conceptualization that focuses on internal relations. At least that is defined. Um, so now we come to resilience is all this, but we can strip it down. Resilience has different components. So for example, by body heat, it's an internal monitoring. I also have an external monitoring of light and temperature. Uh, I have a modular body. For example, my heart is here. My heart is not everywhere, and that has a purpose. If I'm hurt here, my heart will not die, right? So I'm lucky. Oh, we have reduplication. We have two eyes. I can lose one eye, and I have two ears. I can lose one ear. We have a memory. We can tell our children. We can reduplicate. We have children and tell them how to do, etc. We have all these different mechanisms which all contribute to resilience, and all these are, as in biology, parts of culture. So, and this is the, a strong claim, maybe the strongest claim we make, that cultural practices, all cultures' practices 
are implementations of these resilience functions. They are either monitoring or transmitting or memorizing or um, applying some schemes of uh, handling stuff. So resi resilience research, till a minute. Oh, I don't, know, I don't make it. Uh, resilience research is, I skipped that. Oh, okay. Uh, Culture operations. So, having talked about culture practices, culture operations are how one culture operation gets into another culture operation. That is the uh, most important thing. So, kind of, you have this operation which operates on culture practice one and generates culture practice two. How can that work? Some things are, are very easy, I can explain, but sometimes we need uh, an, a, a pool of culture practices, and then by analogy, we can create a new culture practice. So our claim is that uh, the amount or the size or co the connectiveness of this pool of social practices, culture practices, which allows to create new culture practices is a kind of indicator of resilience. So please read up. So, I show you a number of culture operations. To the right, we see, okay, here we see the garden as we have known. This is a kind of upgrading. This is the Japanese government made big gardens. But the Japanese, when they conquered, conquered and colonized it, they want to make some good things. So they made huge gardens, upgrading. Uh, this is the same. Uh, you see also here, they try to make the, the huge garden. This is something like 60 meters, 60 meters, and here we have uh, by 10, something like that. Uh, here we have down, down, downgrading, making, making things smaller. So let's say this is the standard way you have the big garden, right? And the small is you have a, a, a tiny garden. You can apply the same thing big and small. Uh, right direction. Ah, then we have the power relation. Uh, this is a case of what we call recuperation because we most in French, recuperation. In English, it's called more co-opting. That is, this is what the people do, and then the government says, oh, we make it bigger. We, make it. we force you to make it bigger. Or, or two. Uh, transfer is where you apply the same technology to another object. So here we have, uh, here we have a, a wall protecting a garden, and it's applied to a wall protecting the city. And we have uh, adaption. So for example, you see the two gates. This is, let's say, a normal gate. And this is a gate, I don't know whether you can see, uh, the opening is here, and then back you have a long wall to both sides. So if the wind doesn't go directly from here, and it does not, it comes from here, that is, you can go through, you can leave that area, but the wind is stopped. So uh, the idea of gate, according to uh, the context, is changed. Uh, okay, then final two slides. There are, there are culture operations which operate within a community. So kind of uh, each community is its own greenhouse of operating and ex experimenting. But sometimes uh, there is a transfer. Once structures have consolidated between community, com communities, something consolidated is transferred. So these are two two small temples of neighbor villages, and this and this is kind of similar. And this is the same kind of temple of another island, and this is one, island, uh, one village and the other village, and they are also kind of similar, and this is not similar to this. So, uh, practices are borrowed from the neighbor village, or from near villages, if they show to be uh, applicable, robust, etc., or interesting. So, summary. We try to use a strict analogy between biological and cultural re resilience based on survival, the idea of survival. Uh, our claim is that resilience functions can be used as an annotation for tangible and intangible culture practices. That is, we annotate a culture practice according to which resilience function it fulfills. Or, if we are mainly in interested in resilience, um, we can show how resilience is implemented in cultural practices. Uh, and the potential of 
beneficial transformation can be estimated from the connectiveness of the different cultural practices, spatial and conceptual. Future, we will induce more grammars, have to verify them empirically. Uh, we have to identify analogies between the different grammars that are within a culture and um, identify the analogies within the communities and among the communities. So that's it. Thank you very much.